we're really fortunate to have Dr. Jacob Warbrook, is, who is an associate professor in the Information School and by courtesy in Computer Science and Engineering at the University of Washington, where he directs the Mobile and Accessible Design Lab. He is the founding member of the Dub Group and the Master of Human Computer Interaction and Design Program. His field is in the, is, his research is in the field of human computer interaction, and he seeks to understand people's interactions with computers and information, and to improve those interactions through design and engineering, especially with people with disabilities. His work has received 19 awards, including se seven Best Paper Awards, seven honorable mentions from Kai, and his work on accessible computing has recently received the 2017 ACM Sekai Social Impact Award. And I just learned that the talk today is a little bit of a preview of the work um, related to that award. So we're kind of getting the first dips on seeing this great work. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Wilbur. Thanks, Casey. I'm um, going to see if we can project here. Volume OK? Is this too loud? <clears throat> I might get excited. <laughs> I should test the excited level of volume here. All right. I'll give us a clean video cut by reintroducing my title. Um, thanks for having me. So I am Jacob Wilbrock. This does feel a little hot, doesn't it? Let's go even lower. Down to, uh, is that better? That's probably better. I'll start one more time. So I'm Jacob Wilbrock, and I'm from the University of Washington Information School. Uh, thanks for having me out. It's great to see so many new and familiar faces. Uh, many of you have spent some time at the University of Washington. Can I actually see a few hands? I know there are at least a few. Yay, we're all cousins. I love you guys. Um, so thanks for coming. And I'll be talking about ability-based design, elevating ability over disability in accessible computing. Uh, I grew up playing basketball in the era of Michael Jordan, so any chance I get to put him on a slide, I take it. Um, so yesterday I woke up in Seattle. And only some hours later did I find myself all the way over here in, um, in Ann Arbor. And this got me thinking. And I was reflecting on the number of different modes of transportation that I took to get here. Uh, everything on here is actually uh, something that I had to ride on. And it all had one point. Yeah, there's a lot of noise coming from your shirt rubbing that it gets the microphone. Yes, you are right. OK, we have a usability problem because the side side of my shirt. Maybe that. Better? Thanks. All right. Uh, yeah, it's peaceful. Um, <laughs> I took every form of transportation that you saw on this slide. Uh, and it all had one point, right? It was to move my body, myself, through time and space, um, and getting myself and my things from point A to, to point B. It's actually a big undertaking. Uh, and yet, um, it was really a simple purpose, which is to get myself here. And it's not just the task of getting myself here, right? It's actually the task of doing so in light of everyone else I'm around, getting themselves somewhere with their stuff, and uh, all the things that we're familiar with when we travel. And it got me to thinking about just how much time and energy we spend, both as a society and as individuals, in moving things through the world, in moving physical things through the physical world. We're all computing professionals of various kinds, and so we're familiar with the idea that data zips through the network, and uh, it's kind of instantaneously where we want it, more or less. But in fact, we spend so much time dealing with things uh, that are physical in the physical world. This is the largest container ship in the world. It's actually, it's a coincidence that it's out of Seattle. Uh, but to give you a sense of scale, this is a tugboat. That's a Coast Guard-sized tugboat vessel next to this behemoth of a container ship. <coughs> Um, that was the co-chair of uh, the co-chair, the program co-chair of WIST in Japan last fall. And if you want to experience your body moving through the world with other bodies, try to ride a Tokyo subway at rush hour, and uh, it's quite something. But you really experience your body in a in a in a different way, along with other people. And in fact, some of our most memorable experiences in life come from altering how our bodies. Come from how our bodies normally experience, changing how our bodies normally experience the world. 
So think not just how this looks, but how it might feel to, uh, to bungee jump head first from such a height. Anyone a bungee jumper? I've never done it. No? A room full of very smart people. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, altering how we physically experience the world is, uh, is a fundamental way that we uh, change our relationship to our body and to uh, the world. I just realized I will need audio for some of the later videos. Is there an audio jack here? It is. Let's see. Okay. Just when you think you're set up, you realize you're not. All right. We'll try that. So what does this have to do with HCI design? Well, actually uh, a lot, because when we design things, whether they're paper sketches or uh, digital prototypes or physical prototypes or anything in between or those combinations, we're actually giving bodies, we're giving embodiments to ideas. And this is actually a fairly profound transition, right? And a lot can be said, of course, about this. Whole talks are given on this. The field of phenomenology is, in some ways, concerned with embodiment of these kinds. Uh, but this is also where the challenges a lot uh, lie and arise, because when we design things and give them embodiment, we can't always anticipate all the ways in which embodied other people uh, encounter them and the challenges that arise as a result. Uh, there's just no way to always uh, anticipate uh, those kinds of uh, encounters. To give a concrete example, at the UW Hub, some of you will recognize this, there's a set of displays that are wall displays, but they're touch screens that look like this. There's a word on here that always stands out to me. Anyone guess what the word is? Just. Just. You're exactly right. The word just. Just touch the screen. Well, actually, it's not so just touch the screen, is it? Because there are a lot of ability assumptions inherent in doing this. You have to be able to raise an arm, extend, uh, lift from the shoulder, um, form a hand that can extend a finger, uh, and then land cleanly on the display. You can't be seated, so you can't reach this if you're not standing. And, uh, and you have to be able to land and lift uh, in a way that indicates you know, kind of a single point on the screen. That's a lot of ability that re is required, and so it's not really just at all. Um, uh, and so we can think about some of our greatest inventions, uh, and they don't just have to be physical forms, they can be the, the screen displays or uh, other forms, but our greatest inventions in HCI all come with a set of assumptions. <coughs> what are the assumptions that people have to be able to meet uh, ability-wise to be able to use these things? So I call these ability assumptions, and we can actually reflect and enumerate assumptions about the technologies that we encounter and design. One question is, when we design things, what are the assumptions, um, where are they coming from? Do they reflect assumptions about our own abilities, a kind of first person view? Do they reflect assumptions about the abilities that we imagine other people having, or maybe somehow the average person having? Uh, let me tell you a story about the flaw rather than the law of averages. So in 1952, the U.S. Air Force was, using, was losing uh, countless, well, high count, uh, high count of, uh, number of pilots, uh, peacetime crashes every, um, every well, month, uh, even every day. In fact, it got so bad they lost 17 pilots and planes in one day uh, to what they considered were cockpit errors. And these are peacetime, these are not wartime crashes. Uh, so they set about a task to redesign the cockpits. And the way they did that is they took 4,000 uh, pilots uh, and they measured them on 140 different physical measurements. You know, the lengths of their arms, lengths of their legs, uh, reach, grasp, all this kind of thing. And then they said, well, let's, uh, let's design cockpits to meet the average of those 140 measures. Seems reasonable. Um, and then uh, a scientist in the Air Force said, wait a second, taking just the, what were considered the 10 most important of those 140 measures and giving them each a 30% tolerance, he wanted to know how many of the 4,000 pilots would fall within those averages. Any guesses? Just 10 metrics, 30% tolerance around each of those means. Any guesses? How many of the 4,000? 5%. 5%, one guess? The answer is zero. Not a single pilot fell along those measures. 
people are just not that regular. They're not that average. Uh, so what they did instead was they designed the cockpits for the 5th to 95th percentile along those measures, and then allowed the pilots to make uh, configure, configurations of their own liking. They could, they could adjust the settings. And suddenly, the crashes stopped, and the Air Force uh, was very happy and, and you know, became a world force. Um, so I've spent the better part of the last 15 years thinking about people, their abilities and their, their embodied nature, and how they move, and how they act, and how that interacts with our technologies in all of its embodied forms. And I want to talk to you today about some of the projects that we've done and how that's led to uh, an idea we call ability-based design. So we'll start with uh, some simple ideas. What's ability? Um, one definition that I like is the possession of the means, um, of the means or skill to do something. And I highlighted do because it's really about effecting the world, right? Effecting change in the world. It's about taking action. It's not just thinking, right? It's actually carrying out something uh, further. Uh, you'll all be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Uh, but it also stands to reason that if there's a need at each level, we could also consider an ability to meet those needs at each level as well. Uh, today we'll focus mostly on the kind of lower level aspects here, uh, sensory motor abilities and things, but one could explore further up uh, this triangle. We can also talk about disability. Uh, the World Health Organization definition from 1976 was any restriction or lack of ability to perform an activity in the manner or within the range considered normal for a human being. I highlighted some of the problematic text at the end. Fortunately, things improved and the definition in 2001 came to reflect a much richer understanding of uh, not just body function, uh, but also activity, and, and I'll highlight environmental factors as well. Uh, the environment obviously plays a big role in ability and disability as well. But we can also think about dis-ability as uh, the idea that if ability was the possession of the means or skill to do something, then not being in possession of the means or skill to do something could be considered a disability. And under this definition, we all have disabilities because we all have things we can't do. Um, and so I like this uh, thought experiment a little bit here because it helps debinarize the notion of ability. It's not just you have a disability or you don't. We all have abilities, and there's a fluid uh, notion here about what we're able to do and not do. There are certain things that we regard, as far as personal attributes, that are positive valued only, like weight or height, right? So we think of these as kind of up from zero. Um, but with abilities, we actually kind of conceive of a negative space, of ability being positive and disability somehow below the waterline. Uh, you know, what would happen if we think of ability as positive value only? You know, if we kind of get rid of that area below the waterline. That's a reflection point that I'll leave with you. So I call this the positive affirmation of abilities, that everyone has abilities, some people more than others. We need to design for people with abilities of all types. I'm not the first to make this observation by any means. Alan F. Newell, who won the Social Impact Award about 10 years ago, I think, uh, talks about extraordinary abilities, that common sense and observation show us that every human being has a set of abilities, some of which can be described as ordinary, and some of which are very obviously extraordinary. Uh, Microsoft's inclusive design webpage has a similar language. Everyone has abilities and limits to those abilities. Designing for people with permanent disabilities actually results in designs that benefit people universally. Constraints are a beautiful thing. And anyone in the room who's um, a practicing designer uh, will understand that, that point about constraints. So I like this image. Uh, anyone know the sport depicted here? Murder ball. Murder ball. Exactly right. Quite a name. Uh, sometimes referred to as wheelchair rugby. I think it's rougher than actual rugby from what I've seen. It's called murder ball. This is the US national team. And it's a great image of ability and so-called disability juxtaposed. We have someone who's literally leaping and diving within their wheelchair. Uh, obviously, extremely athletic person, but in a wheelchair, which is people's stereotypical notion of disability. Right? Uh, so uh, that's just a fabulous image. Now, it might seem, in I don't know, today's 
modern sensibilities within the enlightened realm of the ivory tower that this positive affirmation of ability should just be something we have always done, right? But actually, it's not been this way. It still really isn't this way. Uh, coming out of the World War II era, assistive technology was about replacing lost function. You lost an arm, we give you an arm. You lost a leg, we got lots of legs. Have a leg. And we uh, try to replace what you lost so that you can conform to the world as it currently is. Right? So that stairway that the image you saw in the previous slide of the woman with the wheelchair facing the stairway, you know, under this model, the, the issue is that she needs a way to walk up the stairs, because there they are. Uh, and so we would adapt ourselves to uh, the expectations of the world and the environment that we're in, both physical and social. Uh, we still do this, right? So uh, we still adapt ourselves, and systems that, to which we adapt ourselves are rather oblivious to the fact we're doing it. So this person using this uh, hand pointing stick is working on a keyboard that has no idea it's not being touch typed with ten fingers. The middle image there is a woman typing with her feet. An amazing ability, an extraordinary ability, but the keyboard and the, and the interface, they don't know that. And, and so on with these other devices. And it's actually even more complicated today because the question of what a computer user is today is itself more complex <laughs> and rich than the question of what a computer user was during many of our upbringings. Um, in, 19, in the 1980s, a computer user could count on a stable environment, quiet setting, nice comfortable seating, uh, temperatures that are uh, reasonable and comfortable, um, not too much distraction, and so on. But a computer user today, like this picture, it might be a fellow on a beach with a laptop on his knees. It looks actually <coughs> like it's a wintertime setting because he's got a hat on and he's dressed fairly warmly. Uh, there's sunlight glare on the screen. There's all these environmental and contextual factors that come to bear on his ability to interact. I'm also not the first person to make this observation, Alan F. Newell. Uh, again, uh, in a chapter from 1995, showed a picture of a soldier um, in an office setting, um, heavily disabled by the context in which the soldier finds himself. Stuck in the mud, explosions going off, heavily encumbered by what the soldier's wearing. And if you want a more realistic picture, here's a shot from Newsweek in Afghanistan. And I'd ask you to think about the abilities these soldiers have in this moment, or shortly after this moment. Uh, clearly different than they have maybe even a few moments later. Situationally induced impairments and disabilities, although it's a mouthful, uh, have been uh, defined by Andrew Sears and Mark Young um, as both the environment in which an individual is working and the current context, the activities in which the person is engaged, can contribute to the existence of impairments, disabilities, and handicaps. This also means that disability is something that applies to everybody in various ways. We're not saying, I'm not saying, at least, that the, this is the same as having a permanent disability. I'm saying that a perspective of this kind can lead us to uh, opportunities for design to actually improve interaction for a huge range of people. So take walking. We know from studies that when you walk, uh, you have reduced reading speed, reduced motor dexterity, uh, divided attention, reduced ability to maneuver and avoid obstacles. These are just some of the things that come to bear on you while you walk. And uh, we see uh, effects in society as a result. These are signs that have recently gone up in Stockholm, Sweden, uh, that warn drivers not to run over oblivious people who are walking while texting. So this is not for the texting people's benefit. All it is is that they don't get run over, but, uh, but it's for the drivers not to run over them. I don't know if this is staged, probably, but if it's not, it's quite a coincidence that in the background of this photo is someone texting while walking. I think that's hilarious. Uh, Hayward, California. Heads up across the street. Then update Facebook. Uh, South, Seoul, South Korea. Two lanes. Cell phones walk into slain at your own risk. Or no cell phones. Now, it turns out this is uh, somewhat failing as a social experiment but not because people aren't actually walking in their proper lane. It's failing more because so many people want a photo of the paint instructions on the sidewalk. <laughs> they're blocking people while they try to obey the lane that they're in. Utah, $50 fine, civil penalty for distracted walking. They'll slap you a $50 fine, it's $100 the second time. These are, these are real things. Uh, no texting while driving, of course, this one is obvious, and. We should uh, all 
take this very seriously. Don't text and drive, please. Um, hopefully this photo is staged. Uh, but it's not just driving. No texting while biking is a common ordinance, particularly in some East Coast uh, tourist towns, especially when they fill up with bikers during the summer. And I don't know what's going on here. <laughs> this, is a real, this is a real photo. Um, stunt rider who's texting while standing, facing backwards on his motorcycle. And even more extreme, this is the first website built entirely in midair. So they jumped out of the plane, started the construction of the website, and had it completed and up and running by the time they hit the ground. Uh, what I'll point out is not only are they pretty situationally impaired, but the device they're holding has really no idea it's falling through the air at a certain speed. Right? I mean, the, the device might as well more or less be on an on office desk. We don't have to be that extreme to make the point, though. I saw a woman on a bus recently who had one glove on and one glove off. I said, I'm dying to know why you have one glove on and one glove off. She said, I had to take off my right hand glove because I had to use my phone. I said, yeah, but your glove has these little fingertips that are supposed to be able to use your phone. She said, yeah, they just make it worse. They don't work. Yeah. So even the things that we design to overcome situational impairments, in this case, encumbering you know, uh, clothing, actually caused more of an impairment. So we spent some time trying to surface a number of the ways that environments can impair us and, uh, and do certain projects to address these limitations, which kind of unifies across the ability spectrum the different ways that uh, impairment affect all of us. And I'll show you some example projects. We will have projects in the second part of the talk. So let's step back and ask what if. What if we place the burden of conformity to these ability assumptions not on the users, but on the systems? Shouldn't we ask more from our systems to be able to do more for their users? And what if we had our systems be aware of our situated abilities? So abilities in their situated context, and we supported those abilities better. And what if we had a design approach that actually were able to bring these things into account, ability and situation? And so that leads us to ability-based design. I know it's funny, I make pop art myself. Um, I'll show you the filters that make these little pictures if you want them. I have many, many others. You'll see, you might even see yourself some of these. Um, so uh, an ability-based ability design is a design approach in which the human abilities required to use the technology in a given context are questioned, and uh, systems are made operable by or adaptable to alternative abilities. So that's, that's the approach. Um, so there are a few aspects to this that I want to illustrate. One is an attitude change, that we focus on all users can do rather than um, uh, focus on what they can't do. And we make systems do the work of accommodating the user. So that's kind of flipping the burden, um, as it were. Some strategies for this, and you'll see some examples of this. We can automatically adapt uh, interfaces, and I'll talk about some projects we've had there. Um, also, just allowing the user to configure things. So the US Air Force story was an example of that. Ability-specific customization is also another approach. And also being able to um, uh, just make things usable by a wide range of abilities, which is more of a universal design approach. There's some tension there, though, with ability-based design that I'll highlight. Ability-based design is fairly agnostic, frankly, to what strategy we adopt. Um, it's really more that certain principles are upheld, like systems match users' abilities, not users have to satisfy systems' rigid assumptions. So I'm going to adopt a visual language to explain this a little bit better um, from Alistair Edwards. And uh, when we have a user whose abilities match well with a system's capabilities and assumptions, we have a kind of picture like this, where the user fits nicely into the system. This is probably true for most of us most of the time. And that's nice, and we go about our day. The challenge arises when the user's abilities don't match the system's assumptions. And in such cases, we end up in an assistive technology approach, adapting the user to make the system happy effectively. So we bring in some kind of intermediary adaptation. The user uh, can fit there, and then the, the two can fit the system. And you'll notice that the, the flow of burden moves from the system back to the user, in this case. We want to make our systems do more. So what if we flip that flow, the burden, and the user place the burden on the system to actually match the user better. So imagine the system being able to make this change, again, from something like this to this, and then the two fit uh, together and can work together. And of course, this takes place in a context. It's not just in that 
in a vacuum. So we want this to happen um, regarding situation, context, environment. I'm going to use those terms fairly synonymously, but there are people who have actually worked quite hard um, to figure out really what we're talking about when we're talking about context. And in days work in particular, I highlight. We can also think about then um, the duration of the impairment, right? So we've seen some examples uh, like walking, where if you stop walking, some of those impairing effects go away, uh, that are more ephemeral all the way to more enduring or even permanent. You can also consider what I call the location of the impairment. So is it something that comes more from within a person or more from without, from the environment? Uh, from without would mean that if I change the environment, the impairment mostly goes away. From within is if I put, put the person in, in a different environment, it mostly persists. And then we can actually look at a whole space. So we have a duration on one axis over time um, in a kind of logarithmic fashion, if you will, and then location on, say, the y-axis. And we can actually look at a whole host of impairing things. I know it's a little bit small for you from your distance, but uh, you know, we have things like drunkenness, uh, which lasts you know, hours. Uh, mostly comes from a mixture of within and somewhat from the environment, and as far as how impairing that, that is. Uh, a prisoner's straitjacket might be up here. Heavy pollution could be up here, or the darkness in the Alaskan winter. Uh, most of the assistive technology research has just been in the bottom right corner. So there's actually a whole larger space here that we could consider. And some of it falls in other areas that we don't think of as accessibility research, like ubiquitous computing. Uh, I won't read this slide, don't worry, but we do have, um, over time, formulated principles of ability-based design, and there are seven in particular that we lean on. This is the third version of these that we've come to refine, but they're kind of in categories. The first is the designer's stance, their approach, their attitude, the stance towards the design problem. These are the required ones, and uh, they're present in all of our projects. And then. Um, there are some optional ones concerning the interface, whether it's maybe adaptive or adaptable or configurable, as well as sensing and modeling principles that take place uh, largely for mobile or performance-based uh, settings. I can come back to those in the Q&A if people really want to see them more. So we can now contrast the ability-based design a bit to assistive technology, because we can see that we don't really want an adaptation of this kind, where the user uh, has to accommodate the system. At the same time, we can contrast a universal design because the notion here is that we have a system with a sort of uh, open fit to many different user profiles. But ability-based design is a bit more insistent on a tight fit, as at least as tight as possible between the abilities of the user and the system that it's trying, the user is trying to use. And so a kind of vague or more general notion here is not always going to be in keeping with ability-based design. It's not that it can't work, but it's, there's some suspicion there sometimes. Simon Harper uh, addressed this well, I think, in this quote. He said, to create universal usability by designing for all involves making generalizations about users, and it is these exact generalizations that have led to so many users being excluded from the technological world in the first place. Universal usability is possible, but not by using this design for all ethos, but rather it is only possible by design for one. Uh, the challenge here is to scale that. How do you scale designing for one? Everyone can't have their personal designer. Right? A vision then that we're after, and I'd ask you to think about your place in this vision, if you, if you uh, maybe have one or could have one, is that anyone, anywhere, at any time could interact with technologies ideally suited to their specific situated abilities and that our technologies do the work to achieve this fit. This is uh, obviously a probably unachievable vision, but that's what visions are for. They give us a direction to move, and we see how far in that direction we can get, um, which is why I put it against the god rays here. All right, so let's have some fun with some specific projects. I'm gonna tour through a handful of projects. If I had more time, I'd do more, but we'll do a handful. And I'm not gonna go into depth on any one particular project, but I want you to um, just kind of let them wash over you. We'll play some videos, we'll have a good time. This is, talk will uh, take place in its own session at Kai. And since it's not a paper session, like a paper-specific talk, I don't have to give a damn key value or a result if I don't want to. So you won't see any graphs. I'm not going to show you results. I might mention a few verbally. We're mostly going to watch videos and just have like story time. All right. So first, though, I want to thank all of these fine people who were and have been my co 
advisees or advisees in the past, uh, or in the defendator's case, a postdoc. They really deserve most of the credit for the projects you're about to see. Um, and uh, some are still current students, so I hope you keep your eye out for them. Martez Mott, I'll highlight, who was here about a year ago and gave a talk about Smart Touch, which is one of the projects I'll briefly mention. So um, I'm going to go way back, about 11 years, to <coughs> the end of my dissertation work. And uh, one of the projects we did was called Trackball Edge Right. And in a nutshell, the question was, how can we help people with spinal cord injuries enter text at a faster rate than using an on-screen keyboard, like you see here, uh, where they hover over the keys and they have to wait for a dwell timer. And it's a very painful, pointing-driven process. And what I realized were two things. They have the ability to use a trackball, because that was a common input device for spinal cord injury folks. And the second is they have the ability to pulse or burst the trackball in different directions without fine-pointing to targets. So I questioned that ability and changed the ability demands. Um, and this is where some of the earliest ideas for ability-based design uh, arose. And so first, we'll just look at um, what it looks like to enter text with this approach. It's quite a bit faster than an on-screen keyboard. And then we'll uh, see a brief clip in a, from a news article. Sorry about the cheesy music. So there's an alphabet. We're leveraging, obviously, uh, literacy abilities in that sense, letter like abilities. And there's no pointing involved. This is just um, initiating vector movement, basically, directional movement. This next clip, you'll see. Um, there's the ability to add uh, words into the stroke so that with a single uh, completion, you can, with a single stroke, you can complete an entire word. And that makes it a lot faster. Uh, the words are always in the same place, so once the user gets used to common word positions, they can always make the same, same motion to achieve the same result. Right. Uh, so then um, we did some work in the field with people with disabilities, and here's a little bit of a news story that captured some of this. Some of you may see, um, at least one of you will see your, your former advisor. How it works. Bob places the trackball cursor inside the square on the screen, then moving the cursor toward the corners inside the box in a specific way forms letters. This is the letter A. This is a letter B. There, that's the actual B, yeah. The result is a faster, easier way for people with disabilities to master small keyboards. The uh, whole point is to try and make it much more accurate to do text entry, <laughs> which of course is a key uh, requirement for any... He's aged a little bit. The, the guidance system has literally replaced Bob's traditional keyboard. <laughs> Everything he needs now is in the palm of his <clears throat> hand. I'm Cynthia Demas, report. Okay. Mm. Little shout out to Brad there. Brad uh, will receive the Lifetime Research Award at Kai this spring, so um, he was my advisor as well. Um, the project uh, that really kicked off this idea was Christoph Gaios's uh, PhD dissertation work. I had the pleasure of working with him at UW, and it was called Supple. Some of you may be familiar with this work, but the idea uh, was, and the part that I helped him with was, we had uh, people with different motor uh, abilities, um, pointing, clicking, dragging, selecting from lists, and then we fed that information as a model into the supple user interface generator, which uh, designs, effectively, user interfaces based on the parameters coming into it. Uh, so we have, for example, the default Microsoft Word dialog, and then one designed for cerebral palsy, and one designed for a person with muscular dystrophy, who uh, the <coughs> system has no declarative heuristic knowledge about uh, those about those uh, different um, abilities, uh, it just is using their motor interface. You generate a customized user interface adapted to a person's motor abilities. So will first collect information about how a person uses a computer. By observing the user perform various basic tasks, Sorry. such as pointing, dragging, clicking, and list selections, Supple builds a model with that person's unique motor abilities. Supple's optimization algorithm then calculates the interface that maximizes that person's speed when using a particular program. How does Supple do in making computers easier to use? 
Here are some real examples from our user studies. This is an interface you saw earlier, but now Supl has redesigned it to be the easiest to use for a person with cerebral palsy. This user could make fast but inaccurate movements and control the trackball with his chin. Notice that all of the elements in this interface are enlarged to make it easier to click on them with the mouse pointer, and the lists are expanded to reduce the need for scrolling. Now here is the same interface, generated by Supl, but now for a person with muscular dystrophy who could make slow but accurate movements. Notice that all of the elements in this interface are smaller, more tightly laid out, and they are all presented in a single view rather than being split across three tabs as was the case with the other interface. <coughs> as these examples illustrate, no single design can address the needs of all users. A design that helps one person will be no good to a person with a different set of abilities. So in this case, effectively, we're making the interface aware of the user's abilities, even though the device itself um, that's mediating that expression of ability is unaware of the fact it's being used with someone's chin, for example. All right. Dancing around my windows here. Uh, Supple changed the interface, but kind of left the <coughs> pointer as, as it is. Um, the angle mouse did the inverse, so it actually looked at or the reverse. It, it did the, uh, changed the pointer and left the interface as it was. So the insight here was that as people move towards a target, uh, the angles <coughs> that they move in go from a fairly coherent spread, if you look at the size of that fan, to uh, because of the correction around the target to a much bigger dispersal of angles. And if you measure that continuously, you can drop the control display gain proportionately so that the target becomes bigger in motor, what we call motor space, even if it's not bigger in visual space. So the targets don't change their size visually, but the, the effective size for the user as they move on the desk is enlarged. Uh, and we do this you notice, without knowing where any targets are. It's just based on the user's behavior, which actually means this has, can be and has been deployed because if you have to know where all the targets are, it turns out that's not just a practical challenge, but it's even a theoretical one. You can't always define uh, where, where targets on the screen really are. Um, so let's uh, just see a few moments of this. The key insight of the angle mouse is to use the movement of the mouse, and in particular the angular movement of the mouse, to slow down the mouse pointer only when the user is near their target. In this video, the angle of mouse movement is shown on the screen as a gray dotted line. The angle of movement remains relatively consistent while the user moves toward the target, but spreads out considerably when the user begins to focus in on the target. The angle mouse uses this change in angles to slow down the mouse and to enable the user to more accurately select the target. Thus, the angle mouse works similarly to a race car, moving quickly on the straightaways and slowing down to handle the curves. Uh, no user studies to that. Um, so, uh, the other thing is to say about this briefly is that the, the lines drawn were just illustrative. In the, in the real deployment, you know, you leave them off and it's just a mouse. And it was about 10%, okay, I think it was 10% uh, better throughput, 20 throughput for uh, people with various different motor impairments, and actually about 1%, 2% uh, um, for people without. So, that seems to be good for everybody. Um, Voice draw questions the need to point manually at all. And this is the work of Susuma Jurata um, back at UW. And James Landay helped us as well. And the idea here is to use the vocal joystick, which is this, uh, it comes from linguistics, uh, but it's a vowel map that actually continuously morphs the vowel, morphs the vowel sounds uh, such that you can make continuous fluid directional movements by making non-speech vocalizations. I'm going to show you a video where you see the, the problem of painting or doing any continuous motion with speech. Discrete speech sounds don't map well to continuous movements. That makes sense, right? Um, but uh, uh, you have to do something different. You have to have a continuous mapping to continuous things. Mouse drag down. So this is just Microsoft Paint. The limited number of movement angles and the stepwise movement speeds, the resulting stroke appears rigid and geometric. You see the discrete commands mapping to changes. Top. That wasn't recognized, Top. and now... When the speech recognizer fails to recognize the user's command, the pointer continues to move, leaving a trail of undesirable paint. 
undo. And now we lose the whole. Undoing effort. a stroke can be costly, as the entire stroke must be recreated. So what we want instead uh, with voice draw is a continuous mapping to continuous output. So the question is, do people have the ability to do this kind of continuous vocalization? And hopefully this will play. some of the uh, artwork that initially was created with Dragon National <coughs> Speaking and Microsoft Paint. This is by a gentleman named Philip Chavez, who's a voice artist that we worked with, we found in Berkeley. Um, and he created this already. This is one of his favorite pieces that he'd made. And we said, could you, could you kind of approximate this with voice draw? And in so doing, we'll learn about how you use it, and we'll see what comes out of it. And he made this. Uh, and uh, so when we look closely, we can see things like all of these discrete angular movements have turned into much more fluid paint-like <coughs> movements. Uh, and uh, even though this was his familiar setup, this only took a third of, of the time. So that was a very satisfying collaboration with um, Philip Chavez. Fortunately, he passed away not too long after we worked with him. Uh, but he made some amazing works of art, and we're flattered that he spent some time with voice drum. Here's another, um, another painting as well. <coughs> um, so then some of the work went towards mobile. And so in 2007, um, I began to work with Sean Kane and Jeff Bigham on a question about if you're blind and you've got these newfangled touch devices coming out, the iPhone 1 was just out, how are you going to interact with a screen you can't see or feel? because we were used to tackle buttons on most of our flip phones. And so that was the kind of ability question. And what we came up with was slide rule, which actually is a design that involves various gestures for reading the screen, the speed at which the finger moves determines the detail level that's read, and you can select targets with a second finger tap that uh, uh, allows a finger to land anywhere on the entire screen, so you're not trying to aim precisely. Uh, but it selects whatever was just read under the reading finger. Um, it's more intuitive than that sounds. This is probably the most influential project we've done because Apple picked up the design ideas in VoiceOver, and I'll show you that in a moment. Uh, but let's jump to here. We'll just watch a little bit of slide roll. So you saw this, the second finger tap there. So there's a variety of gestures that work there, but you can see the basic idea through the reading finger and then the second finger tap and the different swipes. Um, so we were notified um, a year or so later, maybe two years later, uh, from an Apple engineer that said that uh, slide rule was something that they looked at very closely when they were designing voiceover, which is a very popular accessibility feature in iPhone. On Android, it's called TalkBack. So probably I've just covered most of the room, no offense to Microsoft. And so you can turn it on and play with it, but it'll support the kind of interaction you just saw. Of course, there's a whole product rather than just a research exploration. It has a lot more features in it and so on. But some of those core ideas came from our work, which we're very pleased to see out into the world. They called that second finger tap split tap. It's a 
totally a better name, and I guess that's what you get with a fancy marketing department. Um, but in our case, uh, we had to settle for this academic name, second figure cap. We applied the same ideas to something called Access Lens, which was saying, could we do slide rule but on non-computational screens like uh, paper, paper documents? And so with Access Lens, we actually see um, uh, someone with a worn camera could interact with Ranger Valley, West Seattle, Seattle paper. Downtown, Capitol Hill, Downtown <coughs> and the access overlay to right edge, eight items. This is where we're projecting those targets out to the side. Valley. Hold here for directions. Overlay downtown. And so as you uh, move up, they kind of turn into a linear menu, and then you can move to the left to, to access each of those targets. Um, moving up the ability hierarchy a little bit, pushing into literacy uh, abilities, we uh, explored a project called Perk Input, which was mostly by uh, Sherry Asencott, the professor now at Cornell Tech. And the idea was to leverage people's ability to do Braille input, as they would do on Perkins Brailler, which you see on the left side here, um, but with touchscreen devices. And this allowed us to do some nice things, like we can track the drift of hands over time and uh, maximize um, the accuracy with which they're tapping, not by having them hit specific targets that are bounded, but by um, probabilistically matching their finger positions to, uh, to the most likely letters uh, for those positions. And so you end up with a system that looks like this. Obviously, you have to have the ability to already know Braille and enter Braille. The user begins typing by registering reference points. A user can also enter text on a phone twice as fast using two phones. If one phone is good, two is better. <laughs> and this is more similar to a, the Perkins Brailler setup. And why not just go all the way to the tablet? It can also be used to enter she really rips through this one. All of HCI is just reinventing a typewriter, really, right? <laughs> Do I say that on camera? O R space U S E space T A G space T A B L E T space L U H I C H space I S space F A S T E S T. And um, just briefly, since I know you saw Martez's talk about a year ago, but uh, Smart Touch uh, expands the notion of touch abilities and putting the burden on the, the system even more. The idea being that a user can touch a system however they want to, and the system does the work to do the matching of the user's intent, uh, the resolution of the user's intent at runtime. And so with Smart Touch, people can um, touch a, a target and we gather some of those training examples and then we can resolve those at runtime. I do want to highlight a couple of the situational impairment type uh, projects, just briefly. My uncle uh, and others uh, worked on a project called Block Type, which uh, made the following observation. It turns out when you step, you have a systematic uh, rotation to your thumb uh, strike position on a mobile keyboard. Most people, they're, as their feet land, their thumbs will rotate in just slightly, but it's enough often to be about a half a key different. And so in walk type, we would take all of those misclassified strikes and actually heal them into their intended key positions um, by understanding this accelerometer signal and then using a decision tree classifier on top of that. They don't have a video for walk type, that's all right. Um, and so we actually were able to cut error rates in about half with this approach for text entry while walking, which if you've ever done text entry research, that's a huge win. I mean, you never get 50% reductions in any of um, And we went on to a, a kind of similar uh, related idea, which was grip sense, also by Maya Coel, who's a professor now at CMU. And the idea was could the device with its built-in onboard sensors detect the grip with which you're holding it? Because even that grip can affect the ways in which you interact. 
Uh, and as part of that, we actually were able to detect pressure on the screen without a pressure sensing screen. We did that by uh, detecting the change in the gyroscope readings. Uh, if you, uh, when the screen's held for a period, if you burst the vibration motor, you can tell the dampening effect based on how hard they're pressing. This is kind of a cute little hack. Um, and uh, I'll just give you a little bit of grip sense here as we approach the end. Grip sense combines a number of phenomena to detect hand posture. Because of the shape and position of the thumb, users often draw an arc when using their thumbs. These arcs have distinctly different shapes for both thumbs. However, while using index finger, there is no such arc. <coughs> shape and position of the thumb also leads to different touch sizes when we touch different areas of the screen in different grips. The touch size on the same side as the thumb will be smaller than the touch size on the far side. Combining these phenomena together leads to a robust grip detection system that infers between different hand postures within first five interaction steps. This means posture is detected before the user even completes two words while typing. GripSense uses a novel combination of gyroscope and vibration motor to infer pressure applied on the screen. We trigger the vibration motor when a user touches the screen. Here on the right you can see the pressure values derived from a pressure sensor and on the left you can see the vibration information of the device. Uh, and as a last example here, Switchback, which is a project we had last year, uh, or two years ago, I think, at Kai, uh, is, was focused on the idea that while you're walking, uh, we know from prior work that you look at your screen about four seconds at a time, and then you look away, and so on. Um, and so, could we help the user resume their task when they return their eyes to the screen? So the idea is, like, let's say you're reading, and you're looking down each line, and then you look away. When your eyes come back to the screen, can we highlight that cue just by looking back, and then you can resume from that point again? Uh, the answer is yes, we can do that. And the solution was called Switchback. Um, and we used the front-facing camera to track the eye position um, uh, for the user. That's our last little video. Switchback is built upon our focus and saccade tracking, which uses the mobile device's front-facing camera in two ways. Saccade tracking observes the user's gaze as it jumps to different parts of the screen. Here, we show saccade tracking being used in the context of reading. Every large gaze jump across the screen corresponds to a new line being read. If the user becomes distracted, he risks forgetting where he last read. With switchback, however, the system can highlight where the user had stopped. Focus tracking monitors the user's attention. As the user walks off the bus, he must look away from his device. Once the user returns his focus to the screen, Switchback can draw his attention to where he left. Um, so we found uh, improvements in task resumption time and overall comprehension as well. There. And then as a part of current work, we're actually working on DUIs, drunk user interfaces. Trying to see if we can use a phone to detect when people are situationally impaired by inebriation. The use case here would be someone would opt into this, say, with an insurance company to lower their insurance rates if they passed their little battery of tests uh, that they're trying to determine um, before driving, say, after 10 p.m. on a weekend night or whatever. Uh, and so we're uh, running a longitudinal study, getting people variously at various drunk stages, say, you got. It's all through IRB, um, and uh, it's a very popular study on campus right now, among the other guys, I might mention. So a couple quick reflections, and then we'll wrap up. Um, so hopefully you've seen a pattern in this, which is really figuring out what users can do, and then enabling them to do it. And we've adopted the same design stance across the accessibility projects and the situationally impaired uh, projects as well. There's really not been an example of assistive technology, at least as we traditionally think about it, in any of these projects. We've used a lot of the devices that are already present in people's lives and tried to make them more aware of and responsive to the users. Some of the projects had this, what I think is a powerful sequence of sense model and then adapt or adjust uh, to the user. Um, a lot of high end, configure, uh, high end user configurability here as well. Um, and all, a lot of the technologies were more aware of what the users were doing or trying to do so they could support them better. 
I, want, I do want to explore further up in this hierarchy. I think this could be a fruitful model for exploring abilities at different levels um, of life and experience. Uh, there's also um, future work in a more generalized ability model. For each project, we had to sense users for each thing they were doing. But could we have a more generic model that then could be reused? Greg Vanderheiden, who moved from Wisconsin to Maryland recently, uh, is uh, approaching this kind of challenge with something called the GPII, Global Public Inclusive, Inclusive Infrastructure. Thank you. Yeah. So um, he's been hard at work with that for a while. And also, could you actually implicitly train and get the data you need and examples you need, rather than these kind of explicit training phases in some cases? Um, and we've done some work on observing people in the wild through just software and sensing means, but um, haven't, haven't fully connected those dots yet. Uh, this vision I presented, I'll say, is also a grand challenge. Right? And I do think that if we could achieve even half of this idea, society <coughs> would be a better place, and it's worth thinking about. I'll close with a quote um, from Frank Bowie, who was one of this country's greatest disability advocates back in the 70s. It's called the father of Section 504. Um, and he said, in a 1987, so 30 years ago now, um, MIT Technology Review article, he closed it this way. He said, when society makes a commitment to making new technologies accessible to everyone, the focus will no longer be on what people cannot do, but rather on what skills and interests they bring to their work. That will be as it always should have been. I think that's a great uh, quote and a good reminder. Well, I acknowledge uh, all the, the advisees, faces you saw, and even more collaborators whose names are here, funding sources. I'm part of something at UW and NSF called Access Computing, which seeks to increase the participation of people with disabilities, undergraduates, graduate students, um, in computing fields. Uh, so if you're a professor and want to host an undergraduate in an REU setting, we can pay for that. So you can get free help on your work, um, and we can connect you to people. So let me know. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. A little bit over time, so for those of you that um, have to take off, um, feel free to do so. But for those of you that want to stick around and ask um, a few questions, we'll have a few minutes left.